children, you are dismissed to Children's Church. For the rest of us, we're going to be in the book of 1 Thessalonians, chapter 5. It's good to have the opportunity to preach once again while Joel is away. I'm preaching next week, too, so don't let that scare you away. But uh, please come back next week as well. Let me read our text for us, and then I'll pray and ask God's blessing on our time together in his word. First Thessalonians 5 verse 1 says, Now concerning the times and seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you, for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them. As labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are children of light, children of the day. We are not of night or of the darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you are doing. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this passage and for um, the words that you inspired Paul to write. We pray, Lord, that we would be um, expecting your return. We pray that we would be ready for your return and that you would give us um, the right attitudes that we need to have. I pray that you would be with me as I preach, that um, everything that's said and done from this pulpit would be done for your honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. How many of you ever found yourself unprepared for an emergency? You've been unprepared for an emergency. Uh, a few years ago, I was uh, working in a before and after school program, and I just started the job as site director, which meant I was over that school for the morning and for the afternoon when the kids would get there and leave. Now, when I started this job, uh, the school had been in session for a month, and I had to do some training, so I had other site directors there helping me, and they told me this site had not done a fire drill in over a year. And I thought, well, that's not good. We need to correct that. And so when I started my first day on my own, I get there a little after six in the morning, and this was a big adjustment for me to wake up and be at work that early. I'm um, immediately I have a kid that tells me he doesn't feel good, that, that he's feeling sick. And he's in kindergarten, so with kindergartners, sometimes they're telling the truth. Sometimes they're just being a little dramatic. So I had one of the other workers go and hang out with them. He immediately gets sick everywhere. And so I had to find the janitor, I had to find people to clean it up and move the kids out of the room we were in. Later that afternoon, so my day had, not already, had already not been going like I wanted it to, one of the kids, I don't know what possessed him to do this, he decides it'd be a good idea to pour his applesauce down this little hole in the floor where a circuit board was. And when he does this, puffs of smoke just start coming out. And so what do we have? We have an actual fire situation. But there's a problem. None of the kids know where to go in case of an emergency. So we're trying to get kids out the door. We're trying to call the fire department. We're worried about what's going to happen. And I can remember after all the dust had settled and everyone was safe and we were able to come back inside, I said, I don't want to ever be unprepared for this situation again. And as we look at our text this morning, we read about being prepared for the return of Christ. And as we've studied 1 Thessalonians, both uh, when Joel's preached and when I've preached, we've seen the theme of the return of Christ. In fact, it's in every chapter of the book. Every chapter gives us some kind of admonition for how we should live in light of Christ's return. And I think it culminates into last week's passage where Joel talked about the rapture, the resurrection of the dead. But this book is not just a lecture or a timeline of Christ's return. It gives us some practical instructions on how we should live. I believe that today's passage is trying to instruct us on how we can have hope, how we can be expecting Christ's return. Paul doesn't want his readers to be unprepared. And I don't like being unprepared for things. I mentioned the before and after school program. Think about for a second, what would it have looked like for those kids to be prepared for a fire or a fire drill? Well, 
It's less about their physical fitness, but it's more about what they know how to do, their attitude that they have. Do they know how to get into a line? Do they know to be quiet? Do they know the exits to take? Do they know where they're supposed to go? They need the right attitude because an emergency can happen at any moment. And I believe that scripture teaches us that the events leading to Christ's return could happen at any moment as well. Revelation 22:20 20 says, surely I am coming soon. Jesus tells us that he is returning and I believe that this passage teaches us that Christ could return at any moment. Whether you believe that the rapture is the next thing that's going to happen in Christ's program for the end of the world, then we're ready for the rapture to happen. If you think the tribulation is the next thing to happen, then we're ready for that to happen as well. Either way, are you expecting the return of Christ? And what should you be expecting? What should you do as you're expecting this to happen? But maybe a better question that we think about this morning is what can he expect from us as we're waiting for Christ's return? And before we look at what he should expect from us, I want to look at some things we should not be doing, some attitudes we should not have. And the first one is an idle attitude. Christ does not expect us as Christians to have an idle attitude. This is an attitude that says, hey, Christ is returning, he's coming back, and so I'm just not going to do anything. It's a a lazy attitude. These people are not at work for the gospel. They're not sharing the gospel with others. They're not serving in their church. They're just biding their time until Christ returns. And friends, an idle Christian does not encourage the body of Christ. And unfortunately, they'll be found in shame when Christ returns. Secondly, there's a selfish attitude. Similarly, this person looks at the return of Christ, but it motivates them to just be selfish, to try to check everything off of their bucket list, to try to live life to the the fullest. They think about everything they want, and they don't think about what other people need. And just like an idle attitude, a selfish Christian does not serve the body of Christ. They'll be found in shame when Christ returns. Then there's a pessimistic attitude, and this one I think is maybe a little bit more common, People see the world and that it's not getting better, it's getting worse, and they become pessimists. And it's hard because sometimes these people are funny, they have funny one-liners or jokes, but they really turn into these pessimistic people that don't have any hope, that aren't encouraged that Christ is coming back. They're not encouraging the body of Christ. They'll be found in shame when Christ returns. And then finally, notice that Christ does not expect an anxious attitude. And maybe this is you this morning. You see how the world is going, how the world is turning, and it drives you to anxiety. And maybe you have good desires. You want to encourage others. You want to serve in your church, but you're just overcome with fear and this emotion, and it kind of just makes you freeze in place. And friends, despite the fact that an anxious Christian may have good motivations, If they're not serving their church, if they're not encouraging the body of Christ, then they will be found in shame when Christ returns. So we don't want to live in these attitudes. Instead, I believe that our passage gives us four different attitudes that we should embrace. We should embrace these godly attitudes in light of Christ's return. And we're going to see these throughout this passage. The first one I think Paul spends a little bit more time on, it's the attitude of awareness. Like I said, he spends a lot of time on this, five verses, so if I'm preaching and it's like we've still not gotten through the first point, that's okay. This is where he spends, I think, a good amount of time talking about this attitude. Look with me at verse 1 of chapter 5. Paul says, Now concerning the times and seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you. As Paul is transitioning into this new discussion, he's still talking about the end times, but he's not talking about the rapture anymore. He's going to start talking about the day of the Lord. Notice that phrase, times and seasons, and how it's used together. And when it's used together, it often refers to the end times. If you try to get your Bible dictionary out, you just look up times and you just look up seasons, you won't get very far. It's a phrase that when it's used together, it gives us its significance. We see this phrase used in Acts 1-7 when the disciples are asking Christ, hey, when are you going to bring about the the end times? When are you going to bring your kingdom finally to the world? And Christ says, it is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father is fixed by his own authority. So when we see this phrase, we know Paul's still talking about the end times, but he's not talking about the rapture. How do we know that? Well, they needed instruction on the rapture. 
right? He just gave them some instruction on what's going to happen with the rapture. He says you don't need any instruction on the day of the Lord, which is what he's going to talk about. Now ask yourself for a second, why would they not need more instruction on this? I mean, I don't know about you, the end times, the day of the Lord, it's a little confusing for me. There's different things that maybe don't make any sense. Well, there's a couple options. Paul could have instructed them when he first visited them in Acts 17, but he wasn't there for very long. He was ran out of the city eventually. He could have sent them a letter, but we really don't have any record of that. I think that when Timothy was sent to the church, which is talked about in chapter 3, he probably was the one to instruct them on the end times. And that's how Paul knew, hey, you've had a good amount of teaching on this subject. Whatever the case may be, they didn't need more instruction on this, and this led to awareness. Look at verse 2. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Now, this is where we start talking about the day of the Lord. And I'll admit, it can be a little bit of a confusing topic. Maybe you really like studying the end times and you're into all the charts and graphs and different things. Maybe you don't like studying the end times and you just try to avoid this section of your Bible. The day of the Lord can be a confusing topic. It's, the Bible first mentions it in the Minor Prophets. I want to look at a couple passages with you. The first one is Joel 2.31. It says, The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon into blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. It's also mentioned in Amos 5.18. Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. Why would you have the day of the Lord? It is darkness and not light. And then Malachi 4.5. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. So we see the Old Testament prophets talk about this judgment from God. The problem is they face judgment immediately in their context. They were judged by God. The nations of Israel and Judah were sent into captivity. So it's hard for us to understand just from these passages what Paul is talking about with the day of the Lord, but the New Testament addresses it as well. Second Peter 3.10, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief and then the heavens will pass away with the roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and works that are done will be exposed. So again, looking towards a future day of judgment coming from the Lord. Then in the next letter, Paul would write to the Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 2. Now concerning, concerning the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has already come. What was the issue? By the time we get to Second Thessalonians, there were people in this church that thought the day of the Lord has already happened, that it's already taken place. And Paul says, hey, this letter that people are sending, this isn't from us. It's not happened yet. It's still to come in the future. And so what is the day of the Lord? I've got a short definition. It's on your handout. It's on the screen as well. Uh, the day of the Lord is, God's, is the day of God's judgment against sin and unrighteousness. And I think it's at the end of the tribulation period. Now, there's another day referred to as the day of the Lord at the end of the millennial kingdom as well. For our purposes, we're just focusing on this day at the end of the tribulation period as well. Now, I say all that. This passage is not just a lecture on the end times, and you can say amen to that if you want to. It's not just some kind of long, drawn-out discussion on Christ's return. It's actually supposed to give us hope and encouragement and how we should live in light of these things. Paul says, you've been instructed on this, and you know that it's going to come like a thief in the night. Now, we hear that phrase, a thief in the night, we immediately start thinking of security. And I don't know how many of you have looked at security systems. Maybe uh, you've put that in your house. Uh, my brother and I, one time, we had to get something from my grandma's house, some things for Thanksgiving. And he was supposed to know the code for how to get in. Well, whatever he did, we were able to open the door, but the alarm started blaring off. And we were thought to be intruders by the security system. And so we had like 60 seconds before the police were going to be there and we were going to be arrested for breaking into my grandma's house, all because she sent us there to get things for Thanksgiving. All that to say that security systems have increased since Paul's day, but in his day, there was a lot of fear about someone breaking in. They didn't have the complex systems like we have today. 
And sometimes when a thief would break in, it could be dangerous even for your life. So Paul says, you know that the day of the Lord is going to come like a thief in the night. It shows us the unexpectedness of it, the fact that it could happen at any moment and that we should be prepared. Look at verse 3 as Paul now contrasts the attitude of a believer and the attitude of an unbeliever. While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman. They will not escape. When Paul says peace and security, there's a couple things I think he has in mind. First of all, the Old Testament uses this phrase and might inform Paul's thinking on it. Jeremiah 6.14, they have healed the wound of my people lightly, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. The problem that Jeremiah ran into is he would be told by God, this is the message you should give to the people, and it's that destruction is coming, there is not going to be peace. But there were false prophets who said, you don't need to listen to him, there's going to be peace. You have nothing to worry about. So that could inform Paul's thinking as well. The second idea I've actually got in your handout for you, it's called the Pax Romana, and it can be translated as the peace of Rome. Rome had enjoyed peace and security like um, no other empire had to that point. They had conquered much of the known world. And so the thought was, if you live in that empire, you don't have anything to worry about. They've already destroyed all their enemies. It led to this idea that they had peace. But Paul says you don't really have that peace if you're not living for the Lord. There's going to be destruction and judgment, and it is going to come. And he says it's going to come like labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. Now I'll admit, I may not be the best person to explain this illustration that Paul uses for us, uh, of labor pains coming upon a pregnant woman. But we can all get the idea that when a woman goes into labor, even though they're expecting their baby to come, it can be sudden right? It can be painful, but at the end of the process, a child is born. And oftentimes, when talking about the end times, Paul uses this illustration to remind us that the day of the Lord can happen at any moment, and there is no escaping from it if you are an unbeliever. He continues to talk about this in verse 4. He says, but you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. Again, he says, you should know better. You should be aware. You've had teaching on this. Darkness refers to a darkened understanding, the the life of an unsafe person who doesn't know what's coming, who is found unaware. It's contrasted to those who walk in the light, like John says in 1 John 1, 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. The illustration of light and darkness Contrast how believers and unbelievers live. People who walk in the light are okay having their deeds shown in the light because they have nothing to be ashamed of. Those who walk in darkness try to hide their own works because their works are evil. So this causes Paul to say, you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not children of night or of darkness. To be a child of something means you have a relationship with it. Believers... We're children of light. We walk in the light. We're children of the daytime. We can have our work seen by others. So do you have an awareness of the day of the Lord? Let me encourage you, don't neglect the study of the things to come. Now, this doesn't mean you have to become obsessed with it, right? This doesn't mean that this is what you spend all your time thinking about. But do you have an awareness of what is coming? Are you devoting yourself to studying God's word even what it says about the end times. Don't just call yourself a pan-millennial, which means it's all going to pan out in the end, and I don't really know what's going to happen. Take some time and try to understand God's plan for the end times. On the flip side of that, I would also encourage you not to become divisive over these issues. There's a lot of things I don't understand about the end times, and I'm willing to admit that here as a pastor here. There's a lot of things, different views on the rapture, the millennial kingdom, and all the events yet to come. And so I believe that as believers, we should commit to study in the end times, but we should not let secondary issues become primary issues in our lives or in the lives of the church. We can have different opinions on this stuff, and that's okay. The thing that I think is important is do you believe that Christ is returning? 
Do you believe that he's coming back? And are you ready for Christ's return? A second attitude that we should have is an attitude of alertness. An attitude of alertness. Paul is going to show us how this mindset, these attitudes, work themselves out in practical ways, starting in verse 6. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. He's continuing this analogy between light and darkness. He says, let us not sleep. Now, for those of you who love your sleep, I don't think he's saying you should stay up all night. Somebody say amen to that. He's not saying that we don't have to get any sleep. As a youth pastor here, I don't plan on doing any all-nighters. It's just not my, my thing. It's not what I enjoy doing. I enjoy getting my sleep. What Paul is trying to show us is that we should be ready for Christ's return. We should be awake. And he's going to use two terms here to describe how we should be acting. The first one is awake, and it refers to alertness and readiness. You're up, you're ready, you're prepared for what's going to happen, you're prepared for Christ's return. That much, I think, is simple. The second term he's going to use is sober. And we often think of sobriety in terms of drunkenness, not to be drunk and not to have your senses clouded. And I think that's in view here. But I really think it just means to have a clear mind, to be well-balanced, to be self-controlled. You're able to be watchful. You're able to look and see what's coming because you're self-controlled and you have a clear mind. Believers should be awake and alert and clear-headed as we await Christ's return. He's going to talk about, he's going to again contrast this to unbelievers in verse 7, where he says, for those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. Again, nighttime is a time where a lot of bad things happen. Those who are not awaiting Christ's return, those who are drunk, who are clouding their senses, they're people of darkness. They're not people of light. In verse 8, he's going to give us a summary in the first half of it. He says, since we belong to the day, let us be sober. Since we're Christians, since we know what's coming, since we have this awareness, let's put it into practice and let's be self-controlled, let's be well-balanced. And this is what he's talking about in the first half of that verse. The second half of the verse, I think, is interesting. It's a little bit confusing for us to try to understand Paul says, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. He starts using a military analogy, and what do we immediately think of when he says this? We think of the armor of God that's found in Ephesians 6. That's a good place for us to go, a good thing for us to think about, the armor of God. But we should recognize it's not the only place where the armor of God is mentioned. In fact, it's not even the first place. Let's look at Isaiah 59, 17. It says, he put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself in zeal as a cloak. Isaiah in chapter 59 talks about God's personal armor that he wears. And Paul applies it to the believer's life and says, we should put on this armor as well. He also talks about it in Romans 13, 12. The night is far gone and day is at hand. So then let us cast off works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Now we have to ask ourselves, why is he talking about the armor of God? Also, why is he using different attributes for it? Notice here, it's not a breastplate of righteousness. It's a breastplate of faith and love. It's not just the helmet of salvation. It's a helmet of the hope of salvation. What is Paul trying to show us here? I think he's trying to show us faith hope, and love. And we see these throughout Paul's writings, faith, hope, and love, and how important they are and how much he emphasizes them. We've already seen them in this book in chapter 1, verse 3, where Paul remembers their work of faith, their labor of love, and their steadfastness of hope. And he's trying to draw our attention to them again. Now, as we've worked through this book, Joel has said that the last half of the book focuses on faith and it focuses on love, which I think is true. I think that this passage focuses on hope, and maybe even primarily so. Notice that hope is listed at the end of this list. It's also listed by itself. And I think he's trying to point us to the hope that we should have as believers. The armor of God is essential to the believer's ability to be self-controlled and sober-minded. So you ask yourself, how am I ready for Christ to return? How can I be aware? How can I be self-controlled? 
put on the armor of God. We need to put on, first of all, this uh, breastplate of faith and love. It's what covers our chest. We need faith, faith that believes the promises of God. You're not going to be ready, you're not going to be alert if you don't believe that God's word is true, if you don't have faith in God's promises for you. Also love. Love encourages us to serve the church. It encourages us to encourage one another, as Paul will say later. We need faith and love, but I think maybe most importantly, we need hope. And in fact, I think this is what Paul is trying to get at in our next point, which is going to be hopefulness, this third attitude that we should have. But before we get there, I want to make this point. If you're here this morning and the return of Christ is not motivating you, if you are not living self-controlled, if you are not living soberly in light of Christ's return, then you might have lost your hope of the gospel. This doesn't mean you've lost your salvation. This might just mean you've taken your eye off the prize. Maybe you've drifted into idleness and you're just not doing anything in light of Christ's return. Maybe you've drifted into selfishness and you're just focused on yourself or you've become pessimistic or even afraid. You need to focus on the hope of the gospel. And I believe this attitude is what Paul is trying to get at here, this hopefulness in verses 9 and 10. Look at these with me. Verse 9, For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, the good news of the gospel, the hope of the gospel, does not begin with us. It begins with God. Who's doing the work here? It's God. And if you're still trying to earn your salvation on your own, if the good news for you begins with yourself and it does not begin with God, then you are not believing the gospel. The gospel comes from God. God has not destined us for wrath, rather, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. This word destined refers to God's original plan of salvation. It was not God's plan to destroy everything. Remember back in Genesis 1 through 3, he created mankind and he created them good. He created them very good. But yet why are we under the wrath of God? Because we sinned. And so what did God do? He sent Christ to take on our to take on the wrath that was destined for us. He actually destined Christ to take on that wrath so that we could have a relationship with God. Christ took on the wrath of God so that we could obtain salvation. This is how we can have hope in Christ. This is our hope as believers. Notice in verse 10, Christ who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Remember in last week's sermon, we talked about how there were believers who were worried because they had lost loved ones. They were sad about this. And Paul wants to encourage them that they'll see their loved ones again. And I think he comes back to that thought here and he reminds us whether you're dead or whether you're alive, you can live because of what Christ has done for you. Believers both dead and alive can now live with Christ because of this hope of salvation. And notice that it's the helmet of the hope of salvation. It's what we wear on our head. It protects our minds it also identifies who we live for. I don't know how many of you like sports. I especially like football. I've kind of made that clear as I've spoken here before. I'm a big Chicago Bears fan. You can see it on my cup. Whenever I watch football, I look for the helmets that have the big orange and blue C on it. And whenever I see that, I think those players aren't very good at football because they play for the Chicago Bears. But it helps me identify which team is playing. Now, growing up, I played t-ball. I wasn't very good. Once I started letting the kids pitch, I was out because I just wasn't very good at baseball or hitting the ball at all. But our team was called the Georgetown Gutter Makers. Now, this wasn't just because we were obsessed with gutter, but this was the company that sponsored our shirts. And so we had to wear that as our name. Now, fortunately for us, we didn't have big pieces of gutter on our shirts or on our hats because that would be really unfortunate but it helped identify which team we played for. Now, when it comes to the helmet for a Christian, 
We don't have a sea. We don't have a star. We don't have a piece of gutter. We are identified with the hope of salvation. And it reminds us that our identity is in Christ. Christ gives us our marching orders. Christ is the one who encourages us to have this great hope. And when you struggle with being afraid because you don't know what's going to happen, you can have hope in what Christ has done for you. And when you recognize, hey, I've been idle. I've not been serving the Lord like I should. You need to go back to the hope that you have in Christ and recognize that this is now your life. This is now your identity. This is how you should live. The hope of the gospel transforms us from being sad, pessimistic people to hope-filled believers who understand that Christ has saved us and he's called us towards holy and godly living. This is the hope that we have as believers. And finally, what we should see in verse 11, this hope motivates us towards encouragement. Our passage today ends the same as the passage we studied last week. It says, therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. Now, I don't think that this, that this attitude here needs to have a lot of time given to it for us to understand it. I actually think that in the next few sermons, as we study the end of the book, Paul's going to explain to us how we can encourage one another. He's going to show us how believers should be building one another up in the body of Christ. Let me give you an encouragement, though, as we talk about this. As believers, we should not use the doctrine of the end times to bully people or to divide the church. There's been a lot of room given to debates on the end times. Some of them are helpful. Some of them are not as helpful. We should study these things so that we can encourage one another. We should study these things so that we can build one another up. This admonition should stop us from using eschatology to bully or divide the church. And we'll look more at this in the next few weeks. But for now, I want to end with a question. Are you expecting the return of Christ? As we conclude our sermon, I want us to meditate on this. Everything we've talked about in this passage points us to the doctrine of the imminency of Christ's return. He could return at any moment. And as we think about that reality, I have two final questions for us. I say two, some of them have more questions than that, but two ideas that we want to meditate on as we close. First of all, are you ready for the return of Christ? Has there come a point where you've put your faith and trust in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Maybe the end times is a scary idea for you. The end of the world is frightening for you because you don't know where you're headed after you die, because you don't know what you face as you look towards eternity. And this just terrifies you. It doesn't have to. You can have hope in the gospel of Jesus Christ and what he's done for you on the cross. We would love to talk to you about that. Please find me or one of the overseers after the service. We'd love to share with you how you can know where you're going after you die. Secondly, if you are a believer here, how does the end times, how does Christ return motivate you and your attitude? Are you alert or are you idle? Does the coming of Christ motivate you towards service and evangelism or does it motivate you towards laziness and apathy? Are you aware of Christ's return or are you afraid of Christ's return? Do you recognize that the events of Christ's return could happen at any moment, or are you living in fear of the end of the world? A right awareness of Christ's return should make us confident when he comes. Are you encouraging, or are you selfish? Do you build one another up with your energy, or do you spend time focusing on yourself? Finally, are you pessimistic, or are you hope-filled? I've met believers who have waited for Christ's return and who have just said, you know what, I don't think he's coming back. I don't think he's returning. I just think if he was going to come back, he would have done it by now. Friends, we know the truth. Christ will return. And when he comes, we want to be ready and have the right attitude and hold on to the hope that he has given us in the gospel. Are you expecting the return of Christ? And remember, as you're waiting for him, he expects these things from you. So embrace them as we pray that he comes soon. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the hope that we have in the gospel, the hope of the coming of Christ. 
Father, I pray that it would motivate us as a church towards holy and godly living, that we would be aware that Christ is coming, that we would live with this awareness in our lives. Father, I pray that we would be alert, that we would be constantly applying ourselves to be sober-minded and vigilant. I pray that we would hold on to this hope, Lord. You would not let us slip into pessimism or into selfishness, but that we would identify ourselves as hope-filled Christians who want to serve you. And finally, Lord, help us to encourage one another. It's hard sometimes to live the Christian life. Help us to not live it in isolation, but help us to be encouraging to the body of Christ here. And we pray that you would come quickly, Lord, and we look forward to the day where we're with you physically and we can enjoy you forever. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.